Yeah, everything you saw the morning of like the people, the stowaways, that was actually like we left. We left while it was still dark, and they left. The, they left as soon as the sun came up. We okay. left. The gates were being breached, and man, you could see them shooting all over the place. I remember the JTAC coming across the radio, telling us, "Hey, man, you got bees, and you got Marines that were prone underneath the airplane at the time." Uh, I remember there was an MRAP out to the side. I've heard 50 cows shot before, and I remember looking at Grace and going, "Hey, you know what that noise is?" He goes, "I think it's gunshots." And then we wind up telling Darren, and Darren, I guess, if we could see it from upstairs. He's like, "Yeah, yeah, they're beside us shooting." Seat tied. Altera zero eyes. We're clear for takeoff. Clear for the airspace. Viper check two. Uh, Viper check two. Viper check two. Brett or Earl. Do you go by Earl? I should ask that before he record. <laughs> yeah, man. A lot of people know me by Earl. It's kind of a nickname I got stuck with. And like, uh, so some people be like, Yoakum, I don't know him. You go Earl. They're like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, we know Earl. <laughs> so that's kind of. Kind of where it's at. Hey, well, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, too bad we can't do this in person. I'll probably be high-fiving you when I'm up in Memphis here in the next couple of days. But um, happy to have you on here. Be excited to hear a little about your career. A little bit non-standard, I think, from most people I have on the podcast. We're going to talk about Afghanistan 2021 because you were tied to that, which pairs with a lot of the episodes we dropped back in August. But I want to jump into it with it, just a highlight of, if you can give me the 60 to 90 second snapshot of your career, and then we'll kind of walk through it, I think, in in, pro, in uh, sequence. All right, cool. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, like back in like 97, I think, uh, I was getting out of high school, uh, going on the wrong path, wound up uh, getting uh, a buddy of mine introduced me into the fire department. So, lo and behold, man, I became a fireman, did half my career as a fireman. So, I did like 13 years or so as a fireman at EMT. Uh, got kind of bored with it. Um, decided to jump over to the to the blue side, went to law enforcement, uh, did a law enforcement gig until I was able to retire uh, last June. Uh, man, I've had a uh, good career. Uh, never, ever really had a job. I tell people that. Like, everything I've had has always been fun, like, always. Uh, and, that's, and then I joined the Guard in my mid-30s. Long story short, tried to get in for a long time. I was a uh, little bit of a adrenaline junkie as a kid, breaking bones. So I had screws and pins in my ankles. Man, I grew up uh, riding horses, rodeo, and motorcycles. Did you catch any flack going from uh, the red side to the blue side? I mean, that's, that's a little great. I did. I did. Uh, I probably should have stayed on the red side at the end of the, at the end of the day, but uh, I did. It was one of those things. Uh, I mean, you only live once, so give it a try. Not only that, but uh, where I was, I stayed in state retirement. So uh, state retirement was uh, the big thing. So, like, all my time from the fire department rolled in over in the police department, so I never really had a break in service. So it was uh, it all worked out. I don't regret any of it at all. Yeah, that's that's good. I was a volunteer firefighter way back when, but it was interesting to learn all the different aspects that go into it. But jumping from that side to the other, it's quite a difference. I mean, fire, you're working, right? But uh, you're in a firehouse when things aren't happening. Man, you, know, you can lift weights. You're right, man. What, not sitting in the yeah, car. What's the old thing they say? Yeah, what's the old thing they say is uh, idle, hand, idle, idle hands about uh, the devil's time. Yeah. Man, you get into some stuff with the fire department. <laughs> so. uh, were, were you in the city doing that? Uh, yes, I was. Yeah, I was. How can you, uh, are you willing to say what city you were in? Yeah, yeah, I worked at uh, Olive Branch and uh, Hernando, and then uh, I was at Olive Branch last, which was uh, the town that I'm close to, and then I swapped over to uh, uh, police department on the side of the county after that. Yeah, I want to talk. I know you did some undercover work, but I want to talk those experiences. Is there anything, yeah, you know, as a firefighter, or I'm sure Leo with the the narcotic side of the house, you saw some things that shaped you or transitioned your transformed your view or outlook on, on life. Anything that was pivotal? Uh, I guess at the end of it all, it sounds kind of jaded, but, uh, as far as the police department goes, uh, I liked the job. But I didn't like the person that it made me. Like you see so much negativity every single day. It kind of starts to make you jaded. Um, I was kind of glad to get out of that, get out of that, uh, whole spotlight or, I mean, right now it's not a great time to be a cop anyway, anywhere. Yeah. So, uh, kind of glad to be able to uh, get out when I got out. Uh, 
I guess the whole thing of uh, all my jobs have been like the unknown. I've never had an office job, really. I've never been able to just go in, sit down, and be like, hey, today, this is what we're going to work on. I mean, as a volunteer fireman, you know that any given second, any moment, like there's no telling what's going to happen. You just got to kind of roll with it. And I guess that's where I function best in life. I don't function real well under like an everyday schedule. Like I'd rather you just throw it at me and be like, figure it out and deal with it. Yeah. So little, little variety, little, uh, yeah. little spice to life there. I guess it, sure. it is an interesting point too, because you just retired last year. What, not to get all political and stuff, but obviously all the, everything that's going on in the United States the last couple of years, I think George Floyd, that incident was definitely a catalyst where you could say a lot of opinions about the police overall transformed. Was there anything that stood out? Was it gradual to you? Or I mean, was it like a, a switch that went off where it's like, this is no longer I, I there's obviously angst and anger towards police more often than not. Yeah, I think uh, I just think that may have been some of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think it also depends on, like, just my opinion, where you are in the country is to, you know, where that where like people were already standing on that whole situation of, you know, the old uh, against law enforcement and all that. But uh, I, I would say that probably went on and pushed it across its edge nationwide. Of course, like they've had some other things here locally again that have, have uh, pushed it. So. Um, I just think it's the nature of the beast. If you would kind of go back and look at a little bit of a history, this is the same thing that happened before. It just kind of comes and goes. Yeah. I got a question for you for your background, which would be kind of the militarization of police. This is just like my observation. I don't know anything about it. Obviously there are things that happen today and there's weaponry. There's all sorts of stuff that was not readily accessible to the public. Like we're talking assault rifles and things like that. But on the flip side, if you see like MRAPs and the police department rolling down the street, you wouldn't have seen an MRAP rolling down the street 10 years ago in the police department. And this is way off kind of the, the subject, but I'm curious, like, do you think um, like training or the, I would say, again, I char characterize it like militarization of like the police, good thing or bad thing. Um, is it, is it needed? I, Ellie, think about All it. Right. I ended up ambushing you here a little bit, but my thing is like the training, right? If you looked at like a SEAL team or any special operations team where they're kicking doors down in bad guy country night after night, one, they're getting those reps, but two, they're doing six months of workup and then deploying versus if you're a right. cop, like what do you get to shoot like once a quarter or something like that? You just don't get the training reps. Yeah. Uh, I will say I was lucky enough to come from a department uh, before I left. We were really, really, so I was a, uh, I was on a SWAT team for quite some time. Um, I was a SWAT team a little bit before I left, and we were really training heavy. Um, so I understand, like, a lot of departments, a lot of places don't have the money or the funding to do that. Not only that, but we have two uh, Tier 1 facilities that are within 30 minutes driving distance of our of our PD, which is a little bit different. Uh, the county here actually teaches a SWAT school that's really good. They bring people in. They actually teach military there. It's actually a really good school they had going also. So we were pretty squared away on the training aspect part, but just like you said, man. So uh, when I got out also, I was over uh, training. Um, I'm a big person of uh, if there's a problem or something bad happens, instead of pointing your finger at them, I've always been like, hey, where do we go wrong in training or what could training done to fix this? Instead of going, hey, that person's wrong or they, you know, they messed up. No, they may have messed up, but let's go back and look and see how we could have kept this from happening ourselves. And I think that's a lot of what people are forgetting nowadays. They're instantly putting the blame on a single officer instead of going, hey, man, when they start holding, I tell you what, when they start holding uh, training divisions responsible, I think things will change and cities will put more money into training. But until then, we're going to be what we're going to be. And there's so many things now where people just want to check a box. Cities want to check a box for insurance purposes. So they're like, we'll do this training. It'll check the box. Checking the box doesn't cut it anymore. You know, we're not there. Um, so you're thinking about MRAPs. So I'll tell you how a lot of places are end up with MRAP because I actually helped purchase one for my yeah. department. So those MRAPs are once the uh, military has them for so long, they can no longer use them. Uh, they're pretty hard to destroy, right? I mean, they're all up armored. So what happens is, is uh, a city can put in for, hey, like we like to get on, uh, we like to get some of the leftovers from the military. And so for $10,000, you're essentially getting a, a couple hundred thousand dollar MRAP. So for 10 grand, we are getting them. And that's what they're doing. Most places have painted them up. Like the city of Memphis actually painted theirs white. I think they labeled it as a rescue vehicle. 
um, other places paint them gray and they use them for whatever they're going to use them for. But at the end of the day, most of the time it's a money deal. Cause if you're looking at trying to buy like an armored vehicle, like uh, something like a bear cat, most departments don't have $200,000 to spend on a vehicle. So, I mean, it's just kind of a cost thing really is the reason you're seeing all these M wraps It's 10 grand versus 200,000. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, not only that, but uh, if you watch the news now, um, you're talking about the militarization of things and our tactics and all that type stuff. You got to remember, too, also, like those people on the streets nowadays, they have the same weaponry we have. I mean, have, I mean, look at the videos if you want to look at Memphis. Look how many Dracos walk the streets here in Memphis. I mean, that gun was designed for one thing, which was killing people. I mean, they're carrying Dracos now, just like they carried handguns back in the day. So that's the reason you're seeing MRAP show up to houses for search warrants. I mean, it's just part of it. It, it should have never gone this far, but that's where we're at. Yeah, it's crazy. I always go back. I mean, there's not enough time. There's not enough resources or people to do the training to be on patrol and then have these guys training. But yeah. that's one aspect of it. The funny side, which I appreciate, I flew with a guy who's like, I just don't understand why they can't shoot to wound. I'm like, you obviously have no idea how this works. Like, you, Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, I want you, yeah. Just aim at this quarter size thing on like, their calf and then oh by the way they're hopped up on pcp or whatever and they're not going to stop like you just yeah you just don't know yeah but you know it, it's gone so far but again like all these things are readily available and people are doing people are doing crazy stuff nowadays yeah you know? i mean i mean you'd be surprised the amount of stuff you come across in search warrants or when we were i mean you come across guys that had mvgs they had helmets they had stuff that was taken from a mil the, you know military base or possibly stolen from somewhere i mean they had the same equipment we have well, even, uh, yeah, like MVGs, that was something that, what if you backed up probably 15 years ago? And I'm even thinking my last deployment, there were times where like, uh, you know, maybe Intel assessed that they had night vision goggles at certain points where they were seeing or reacting. We didn't expect them to react. And that was getting stuff like off the shelf, but it wasn't super easy to get off the shelf. But in right. a matter of like five, six years, I mean seeing these like thermal scopes and stuff like that. The guys yeah. have like on Instagram there that are hunting with them. Like it completely takes away the element of surprise or any kind of advantage. So it's always having to be, yeah, I don't know. Different well, I appreciate you going down that. I do want to ask a little bit about the undercover world. What was, how did you get into undercover and what was that like? Uh, so we did, man. So I was part of a, uh, I was in narcotics. So, I mean, we were like plain clothes. Uh, we conduct some operations. Uh, sometimes, you know, we'd be the buyers or you'd do the selling, or you would do a uh, big thing for us there for a while was like a human trafficking, setting things up like that. Um, it was a, uh, it was a little different. You got to see like, uh, the, I guess almost the underworld. Uh, I guess the only advantage to that though, is you get to see all that. You figure out that like, no matter who somebody is, everybody has a story behind it. So uh, it's one of the things I took, that was a good takeaway I took from it was like, Hey man, everybody's got a story, figure out what it is, you know? Um, so, uh, but. I'm sure you can't, I mean, I'm sure there's some stuff you can't talk about, so we can skip what you can, obviously the, so if we talk, what was the city side? What's like all branch? What size of the city is that? How many people? Uh, well, I was actually over on the other side, which was, uh, it was, uh, the city I was in was, I think at the time, probably 60,000 was the actual residents. But like during the day, there was a lot of commercial during the day. So I think open the day we go onwards of upwards to a hundred. But uh, you got to remember, man, it was a one of the largest suburbs of the city of Memphis. So, like, I mean, you're from there. You literally drive. You've been over here before. You literally drive from Memphis right into right into a DeSoto County area, and you really don't know the difference. I'm so, thinking, too, I forget where that road is. It goes up by the, like, the rail yard on the east side of the airport there. Um. I'm, I'm just oh, thinking of like uh, places that, you know, there's lots of probably lots of volume of stuff. And I hear, you know, at FedEx, you know, customs obviously will snag and flag things that are coming through the sort facility. Yeah. I'm sure it's happening all the time, but I'm thinking that's from where Memphis sits and just a, a corridor an artery to, to pump drugs and people and all sorts of stuff, you know, in and out of Memphis, all the branches probably still pretty, pretty busy little area. I would imagine. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we got Olive Branch, you got South Haven also, which is kind of like, a, that's where I was. But I mean, that's the thing you got to think, uh, a lot of your criminals don't want to live in Memphis alone, you know, beside other criminals. So they just come on down and, uh, next thing you know, they're conducting business across the state line or going back and forth. So it's just the nature of the beast. It's still a good place to live down here, but it's, uh, 
it's just part of it. I guess the funniest thing I've heard recently it was it wasn't funny, but uh, we had a recent election. A lot of things during the election were we're going to keep crime out of DeSoto County. We're going to keep crime out of DeSoto County. Breaking news is is the crime is here. It's just not coming across the state line any more than going back home. Like it's here and it's here to stay. Now the 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 motto should be is like, hey, we're going to deal with the crime in DeSoto County. So, but that's off my whole rant about that. So. Yeah. Well, you'll appreciate this. I, my interview at FedEx, I stayed in South Haven, right behind the Walmart. There's like Hilton. And I I pull yep. up in the Walmart had like the construction marquees saying, "Hey, close until further notice." But a bunch of people and trucks in the parking lots. So it's like, oh, maybe they're doing construction. But uh, two two people got murdered in the Walmart the night before or the day before. Okay, so uh, I don't want to get into a whole lot of that. I'll tell you, uh, it was actually the day. It was actually during the day. Uh, I was, I was, uh, yeah, that was a, a pretty significant day at that Walmart. Um, so that was August of nineteen, up. right? Yeah. So uh, that was a. Uh, I remember his upset employee wound up killing a manager, Jeez. killing the other manager inside. Um, he wound up setting the store on fire while he was in there. He actually shot one of the officers in the back as he was coming out of the parking lot. Another one of the officers pulled up at the same time and wound up uh, actually shooting him in the parking lot. And I think that guy just went to trial and pled guilty not long ago. Uh, no kidding. But yeah, that was a, that was a pretty that was a pretty uh, that was a uh, pretty intense day. How- actually, pretty intense morning. Yeah, did the officer that got shot, how did he do? Did he make it? Uh, he wound up being fine. He wound up uh, actually getting shot in the vest. So, Yeah, well, um, yeah, I appreciate you talking about that. It is one of those things that uh, it's like, I, yeah, when you go into that, when South Haven is nice, Memphis has great parts, but I guess like any big city, you just have to, you just have to have your nugget on a swivel anytime you're walking around, driving around, because, again, you just never know. What's going to happen? Driving on two forty, it's I'm just like it's just, different. Yeah, I'm like I, I, my little, I have a little crappy airport car. I was like, if I die in this car, I'm gonna be one angry ghost, you know. <laughs> so, it's, but uh, digress. So, okay, you uh, law enforcement career, uh, firefighter, law enforcement career, yep. but then uh, talk to me. How did you work your way into the guard? All right, so uh, Tom, uh, my wife actually went up. So uh, she got accepted to the Air Force Academy out of high school. She couldn't go. Long story short, uh, helped raising her brother and sister. wasn't gonna leave. Uh, we're getting ready to get married, and uh, they called again. Uh, she's already been a nurse by then, so she was like, "No, turned it down." So she's gonna go talk to the reserves uh, in Florida, and then somebody told her about the guard in Memphis. She went to the guard in Memphis, wound up uh, uh, going in as a, a critical care nurse. So I was up there with her on her enlistment. And I was actually talking to a recruiter, and he's like, "You ever thought about it?" And I was like, "Man, I've tried. Like, I've tried the Marine Reserves. I already tried the Air Guard once. I'll keep saying no." <laughs> what? And did you go into security forces? Yeah, I did. I went into security at first. Uh, I also I always want to be a loadmaster, but at, at the time they said they didn't have any spots. So. Uh, did my time over there. Uh, I wound up getting an interview over at the load section, went over there, and been there since uh, 19 or 20, something like that. And what year, what did, you, what year did you enlist? Sorry. Uh, 15. I think 15. Okay. So going from law enforcement, civilian side of the house, security forces, which I mean, if you listen to any other podcasts, I do give security forces grief from time to time. I've, I've, uh, you, as you should, uh, you know, especially OSI. I, I talk about with AP and the the guys and the crew that were under investigation for the people coming out of Afghanistan who fell off their plane in the wheel wells. Like, I could have opened and closed that investigation in about two and a half hours, probably maybe three. But so we'll and, and we'll talk about that from the first night too. Just remind me to bring that. Okay, good. Yeah, because that's that. why I'm like I still cannot even understand how this is even a thing. But um, w- I assume you, you got to do all the Air Force technical school for security forces. There's probably nothing that is. Uh, it was. Uh, or- <laughs> it was uh, after doing what I had done already in my career. It was uh, how can I say mind numbing. Yeah, I tried to I try to float under the radar, but uh, it was very difficult. I'll be honest, I refused to take any type of leadership <laughs> role at all. And then uh, 
within about three or four weeks, I was literally forced into it. And so it worked out. Uh, we never had any problems. <laughs> we were one of the few flights that uh, always made it to where we needed to go on time. Uh, everybody was squared away. So I guess it kind of worked out. So we all flew under the radar at that point. Yeah, with the, with the guard aspect and security forces, I assume there's probably a mix of people who came over from active duty. But then there's got to be just a decent number of like hires off the street but I'm imagining your experience at that point was probably a vastly greater than the average person in that unit. Is that fair to say? Uh, it's fair to say. And there were several of us that were, there were some people from other departments, uh, other guys that were uh, either prior Marines that were now cop, uh, civilian cops that did the same job I did. They were just at another department somewhere. So uh, there was, and then like you said, you had your other ones that were just completely off the street that still had no clue. And that sometimes you go, how are you carrying an, a firearm and supposed to make that decision? But they grow up a, a little bit of time. So. <laughs> I guess uh, you got to have a whole village, right? A little bit of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it builds character. All right, let's talk about transition to loadmasters. Obviously, you want to be a loadmaster. I assume you're applying to be a loadmaster while you're in the unit. So it's not new. How does it work? Uh, it's not necessarily applying. It's more of a uh, what they call like an expectations brief. So uh, for the guard, for uh, aviators in the guard, most people think of the, when you think of the National Guard, you think of one or two weeks a year at one weekend a month, right? So that's not the way we operate because, as you know, as a pilot, there's a lot of currency items you got to keep. So we get a lot of additional training days, a lot of additional training days. Plus, sometimes you get at least two weeks. Sometimes you'll get a month of AT. It just depends. There's a lot of ST days. There's a lot of funding to go around to help you keep uh, to keep your currency. So it's more of an expectation brief going, hey, like if you think you're going to come in here and show up once a month and uh, stay current, it's probably not going to work out. So uh, that's what it was. And they kind of talk to you. And then after that, I guess they kind of give you a thumbs up or whatever. And then uh, you go from there. Was it tough balancing your civilian job and that? I only know the airline world, right? Like, Guys drop mill leave and they're going to go fly for the airlines, but it seems like a, so, it might be more challenging in your world. So for me, mine was a little different. Uh, I was close to retirement and my retirement gives me, so state retirement, you can take up to, uh, they'll give you up to four years of uh, active duty time towards your state retirement. So uh, I was gone. So when I left to go to uh, go to low master school, I was gone. I literally stayed gone until last year. I stayed on orders the entire time. Uh, I wound up getting hired full time, AGR. Went back to, I was going to say, I was going to go back to work, went back to work for like one day, see how everything was going to go. And I walked in, I was kind of like, <laughs> I'm so far out at this point. And I was like, dropping my papers, I'm out, I'm gone. Of course, I went back to the guard full time, I've been there ever since. So I was kind of a little bit different. Uh, I see the struggle of, with a lot of people, especially we got some other officers that are in our unit. We got other people that actually work at FedEx doing different things that are load masters. And uh, I mean, I'll be honest, it's a full time job. So it's a struggle. Um, the big thing is, especially if you're out of town or it's a true struggle, uh, they'll only pay for your hotel rooms usually, like if it's drill weekend or if you're getting uh, flying a trip the next day. And you got to fly your locals, you know, you need to fly your locals once every 60 days or whatever, stay current. There's other things you need to do to stay current. So it's tough. It's a, it's almost a full-time job. And now they're throwing the multi-capable airman aspect on top of things. And it's just steadily adding more and more to it. What's multi-capable airman? Tell me about that. Man, uh, so they're wanting, so is a load master now. There's a, there's a list of things that they're wanting you to do or know how to do. Like one of our certification events this time was driving forklifts. We're all, uh, everybody, in the, almost everybody in the unit now certified to drive a forklift. The one where you can essentially pull up somewhere and take care of everything on your own and load the plane and leave. I can see the so. benefit in that. If we're going to the agile combat deployment and just being able to operate in environments that are not quite fully uh, full up, if you will. But I can't imagine when it comes to the training, the manning, like you said, it's a full-time job. So being a traditional guardsman or reservist and doing that doesn't seem too compatible. How are you guys doing when it comes to retention and filling all the spots? That's that's always a golden question. 
man, I can only speak for the load side of it all, really. I mean, I see the pilot side. I think we got quite a few pilots that are getting ready to retire, but I think that kind of comes and goes with yeah. it. Um, but the load side, I mean, retention right now is good. Uh, I think we're facing to have some major changes with the way they're doing this whole average and cycle and all kinds of things that they're doing for like deployment wise. So that may force some people to get out or encourage some people to get out that just don't have the dedication or the time to stick with it. So I guess uh, if you ask me that question in about a year, I may be able to answer. Yeah, fair enough. Well, it, it ebbs and flows with the the economy yeah. and it's how everything goes. So economy's doing bad, then usually retention's really high. But it's interesting yeah. you know, the load side of it. But I think the theme when it comes to the Garden Reserve, I hear more and more people who are less and less apt to take AGR, the full-time positions, because they want to go do something else and be the part-time guardsman or reservist. But – Again, doing it part time, yeah. like that's that's a tough thing to do. Like you're you're never going to be good, but if you just are able to get past some of your minimum requirements, that's that's a feat in itself. Yeah, that's the uh, so that's the whole catch now is they're adding so much stuff to it is that it, it's impossible. It's like they're going to have to add more days or give more time. But like you said, a lot of people, you know, they're so indebted into their civilian jobs, they're just not going to be able to, to dedicate that time to to catch up. Yeah, and. uh I guess the uh, other common misconception, or there may be a misconception, is that the Guard and Reserves, I mean, we play by the same set of rules as active duty. Like, there, there's no different AFI that says we're less trained or we're less this or we're, we're less that. We have the same same duties, same, you know, the same expectations as active duty, but we don't have the time and we most definitely don't have the funding for it. So that's one thing about the Guard is, like, you learn how to make it up, you know, learn how to make it work. Well, if you're full time, that's you know being an AGR. I was like, ah, oh, man, that, there's there's aspects to that where you're not having to go on and off orders. It took me like two and a half hours to put all my orders in my uh, IDTs for next year because the website, you know, was built in like 2013, and yeah, you know, it just takes it just takes forever to get anything done. So yeah. it's done like quick to just like make things happen. So you have all these like admin stuff and just the admin to get to be able to do your job. But you know, what can you do? How, just roll with it. Yeah, that's all you can do. How how has it been? How have you enjoyed? Have you, I assume you've enjoyed being a loadmaster since switching over. Uh, I have. Uh, it's probably been the most uh, one of the most rewarding jobs. Probably, um, it's probably been the. It has been for sure the most challenging. Uh, even though they give you an expectations brief, uh, that really doesn't get you ready for uh, what's about to come later on. What's challenging well, about it? Is it no kidding? Like you don't know what's going on the plane, so you got to figure that out. It's always something different, or is it just a challenging entity in itself? Uh, is there's there's just so much stuff that goes along with it. It's more than just loading an airplane, especially now they're adding things on top of it. Like uh, you're having to get a lot into uh, tactics and stuff now, which I don't think used to be a big thing. Um, they're just adding more and more things to it, and then. Uh, they're doing away with something uh, like uh, some publications are doing away with. So they're making you really get back in the pubs to read things. Um, I guess it's no more just being a load master. There's so much more to it now. Uh, I'm trying not to go too in depth because I don't want all the information put out there somewhere. But it's uh, it's like drinking through a fire hose. Yeah. Every time you think you have it figured out, uh, no, try again. Something has changed somewhere. Well, I think that is going to be the theme of it. And for those like you're paying attention, right? We, the last 20 years dealt with Afghanistan, Iraq, uncontested environments. Now we pivoted to worrying about near peer threats, et cetera. Maybe the Pacific, which I've talked about a couple other episodes. So it's just changing. And um, yeah, it's only gonna be more complex. Let's, let's jump to Afghanistan 2021. So you, um, obviously an integral part to that. Can you talk to me what led up to you? Where were you before going to Afghanistan in that month and when did you get there uh so uh i had come off of what they call mpa orders uh they sent out something from the base and said hey we're going to send a stage crew for 30 days so i wound up having two pilots volunteer to take me and another load master over to uh to the deed for uh 30 days and i guess that's when they were getting ready to you know they're getting ready to do their drawdown um, so I went over there, did my time for 30 days. We did quite a bit of flying with my crew. My crew was getting ready to leave and you could kind of, uh, so that's how I got there. But as that was going on, you're starting to hear things utter about like, Hey, there's going to be something else going on, whatever. So, uh, I was like, man, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to stay. Um, 
So I wound up staying, uh, wound up getting with the admin that was there. Uh, the superintendent, uh, Liam McVell, who if you get a chance to talk to, that guy would be uh, awesome to be on your podcast. He was a superintendent at the time that was over there. Uh, he wound up going, hey, man, if you want to stay, I'll keep you. So uh, about every 30 days, we would get back together and uh, meet up. And then I'd, I'd send an email home. He'd send an email. And they thing you know, NGB sending more money, tell me to stay there for another 30 days. So I wound up staying until like uh, I got over there, I think, at the end of June and wound up coming home like the beginning of October. Okay. Well, yeah, you'll have to connect me with him. So when did you, well, I guess, when did things start picking up? a tempo or was it like mid August? Like when, it, when everyone in the world saw people falling off planes, you knew, Hey, this is it. Or was there any build up to it? There was a little bit of build up, You could tell. So even when I got there at the end of June, we were still flying stuff in and out of there for a little while. Um, and then you started to notice we were taking things out and then we started taking some people in and you were kind of like, ah, I mean, you knew what was coming because of the people that you were taking there. And then all of a sudden, uh, one morning, I think well, I forgot where we were supposed to go to, and then they wound up going, "Hey, congratulations, y'all have been recut." And we stepped to a jet. And I opened, and walked up the crew entry door. We we're doing a hot swap of a jet, and I looked in there, and it was filled from top to bottom. People sitting on ruck sacks, and they were like, "Congratulations!" Like so, they were taking these guys. Was that the eighty second, or was that just a bunch of uh, other random dudes? Uh, that was the 82nd. And then, uh, so I think if I remember correctly before that, uh, a lot of people have forgot about these guys and I don't know how, but we took the Minnesota army national guard in, uh, I think they may have been there before the 82nd got there. Cause I actually took those guys in, we picked them up in uh Kuwait and dropped them off. Really? Ah, yeah. I, I don't think I ever heard that. Yeah. Yeah. The rim right is Minnesota national army national guard. Cause, uh, they got brought back a couple of days out. I ran into them in the armory after all that. And we wound up taking those guys, I think, somewhere in uh, – where do we take them to? We took them somewhere in AFRICOM and dropped them off for exercise, like, right after that. So they were earning their money for that rotation. <laughs> they just wanted to do the one week in a month, two weeks a year, and then they really got into it. Yeah. Well, talk to me about the first flight uh, into Afghanistan once the chaos started happening. Uh, it was, uh, I remember going in for the briefing and, uh, I'm usually pretty good about picking up on stuff and like during the briefing, it was kind of like really nonchalant. And I remember the AC at the time, uh, Darren Gelston, uh, matter of fact, that was his first A code. If I remember right, or, uh, first <laughs> mission is the A code. Uh, and the co-pilot, uh, Brian Contreras, he, uh, I think he promoted that night to captain in the middle of it all. So it was, uh, <laughs> we still, we still laugh about that. But, uh, anyway, I remember the, uh, the Intel brief and then, uh, Intel brief was like, Hey, nothing's going on. It's all good. It's all fine. Like no big deal. And the whole time you could tell something was up. I mean, you could hear the, the people talking in the background. So long story short, step to the plane, um, take off on the way. And then all of a sudden we start getting passed by people on the piffer and he's like, essentially pimping them on the radio like hey you know what's going on he's like oh yeah we're not laying in there like there's too much stuff going on um so we kept on and on and on and then finally uh we get close and uh as a crew we made a decision man he asked he's everybody good i was like man we, i mean we got the 82nd airborne on they've got they've got to get there right uh pretty crucial part pretty crucial role uh, so we decided uh we're going to go regardless. So next thing you know, getting ready to go in. And uh, I think at one point in time, something came up somewhere. They were trying to land people on the taxiway, which wasn't going to, wasn't going to cut it. Cause it wasn't going to hold us. So uh didn't land on the taxiway. Wind up uh, right before we landed. I remember the uh, JTAC was on the radio. I mean, you laughed about it. You kept hearing it, man, land at your own risk. Like essentially you're on your own, like completely on your own when you land, which, uh, I couldn't imagine being an AC for my first A code, having to make that decision to go land that freaking plane. Like he did it though. So we did. And lo and behold, we were there. Um, it was kind of, uh, kind of calm at first kicked off the 82nd. I guess, uh, I guess the most, one of the things I remember the most was, uh, maybe like a Sergeant major or one of their commanders wound up getting on my headset and briefing his guys. Uh, cause the, something about ammunition came up. They had none. 
uh, I remember him briefing his guys on the headset as they were getting off. And he's like, hey, you know, essentially it's going to be a human, uh, humanitarian mission. They're going to show the world that they could do this, no casualties, which, I mean, they had a, which is what they were legitimately obviously trying to do. And they were going to, I guess, get everything they needed once they got to a hangar where they were going. But uh, next thing you know, uh, things started to, to uh, deteriorate quite a bit. And uh, they were bringing Blackhawks down, literally flying them down, picking them up, putting them in Blackhawks, and flying them back down to the hangars. What was going on outside? I mean, was the uh, perimeter if, breach still at this point, or is it? Yeah, yeah. So the perimeter had been breached, uh, from what I remember. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on outside the, outside the gates. Um Right after we landed, also, I remember hearing on the radio, hey, there's two running across the grass. Uh, we don't know where they went. We lost them. And so that went on. Um, so it was just steadily deteriorating. I guess they were seeing a lot of stuff going on that we couldn't see from the plane where we were. And then uh, all of a sudden, kind of all hell broke loose. Uh, I remember uh, I remember Darren went outside to do a walk around in the jet. And uh, with I think crew chief went with him. And... Uh, Next thing you know, by the time he comes back upstairs, when all the hell broke loose. Jeez. What, so uh, when, when all hell breaks loose, t- talk to me about that. What's going on? Uh, all of a sudden, man, you heard helicopters outside. You heard uh, we were we were chatting back and forth with uh, me back all the way up. So when we got there, we had a pilot on the back of the uh, on the back of the on the jet full of uh, all the 80 seconds uh, stuff. So I wound up going back and forth to the guy about, hey, man, like. We're not shutting the engines off because the second we landed, it was it was getting sketchy enough. We just want to do an ERO, you know, engine running offload. There's no reason to shut the engines down. But man, they were they were adamant. Oh no, you're going to shut your engines down and get this stuff off, whatever. And I remember the uh, the commander was essentially saying, "Hey, man, my guys don't have to have that stuff. We'll be just fine." But man, put my put myself in their shoes. I was kind of like, "They're facing to be here. Like if I can get off the plane, I'm gonna get it off the plane. If I have to throw it off by hand, I'm gonna throw it off by hand. They can get it, but I'm not gonna leave here." With uh, you know, all their stuff on the plane, like I'm, <laughs> what wasn't going to do it, uh, which I understand. But long story short, we wound up getting their stuff off the plane, and uh, after that, uh, they started bringing people out. I think we were getting people from the embassy, and then uh, Darren went out to go do his walk around, and then kind of all hell broke loose after that. They were saying the gates had been breached, people were coming across the, the runways. Uh, we sat there for a little while, so I closed back up. Man, we had all the doors tied or all the doors secured on the airplane. Uh, we sat there for quite some time because we were trying to get as many people as we could out. Probably should have left as soon as the first part happened. But it's kind of one of those things. At that point in time, you're committed. I mean, it's a it was a crew decision he asked, and we all decided to stay and see how many people would get on the plane. Um, remember hearing, like I said, everything was breached. Uh, I'll never forget. I don't know who it was. I remember hearing a female on the radio. I'm assuming it was a pilot saying that uh, their plane's been overtaken. Uh, they were talking about they were considered getting off the plane and they wound up not. Uh, I think we were like all the stuff that you hear, uh, like the plane with uh, Colonel Cut and all those guys, they were parked around us. There's another plane parked and kind of behind us too that had some other load masters, uh, Alexis Sanchez on it. I think I gave you her info. Yep. We're talking. Um, yeah. Get her on the podcast. Uh, uh, there was a reservist from Travis, Dom Cauldron. He was on there. He was out there. I think he's one of the first planes like landed right before us, before all that happened. It was just chaos. It was chaos on the radio. I remember the JTAC said he was leaving the tower. He goes, you're on, you know, like I'll try to talk to you. Uh, that's just kind of where it went. Kind of roll with it after that. You're there. You might as well embrace it. <laughs> that's the best way to look at it. Um, Grace had mentioned Colonel Cut. I was like, man, so, yeah, I need to get him on the podcast. I flew MC 12s with him back in Afghanistan in like 2012. Um, yeah, uh, matter of fact, I got to uh, actually meet him not long ago, and he is a uh, he's quite a character. I got to meet him at a buddy of mine's uh, promotion up at uh, McGuire. I think he's retired now, though. He's getting ready to retire when I saw him. That okay. was a couple months ago. Yeah, I'd buy that timeline. Um, yeah, it's imagine still bald, still. So real serious demeanor. Um, Very so. Very, very much so. (laughs) Great guy. Uh, Was his plane was one that was overtaken or what? What that had people? uh, Was it the first one going down the runway? We see people hiding, holding onto the plane, or is that a different, different? I think if I remember correctly, I think those are two different planes. Okay, tough. Yeah, there's so much that goes (laughs) that goes into this. So what? 
you guys, obviously, everything is going crazy. How many people do you end up loading on your plane for that night? The first night, um, I was going back and look at the Mission's history report. Man, probably 130 to 150. It was something like that. Yeah, which uh, that, that's not too – I mean, I say not too crazy. There's an asterisk to all this. It's all crazy, but it's not like 800 people or 600 people where – I, again, right. I imagine as like a load master, you're trying to figure out weight and balance and all that stuff. So it's not to mention the security of the, the app part of the aircraft, like yeah. let alone is this thing safe to take off? Yeah. Well, the thing was from the embassy people, they were bringing everything from their embassy also, man. You know, we had all their weapons, gear, whatever, whatever equipment they had. Uh, none of it was palletized. We literally had stuff everywhere. So it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was a challenge there at first, but after, I mean, it all worked itself out. Um, but yeah, like I said, the first load, uh, and then I think, uh, somewhere in the middle of that grace comes to me cause I'm trying to get people on the ramp. She's like, Hey, I think those two dudes just snuck on the plane. And so I immediately stop everything. I go to the front and I see these two guys sitting there. One's got a backpack, one got a cell phone. And I wasn't going to say a whole lot to anybody, but like for me, from my experience, I'm like, this one dude has a backpack. This one guy has a cell phone. That's uh, those two things at that point in time in my mind did not go together at all. But what are you supposed to, I mean, you don't want to say something, you don't want to say anything. So I try to uh, get them to go to the back of the plane. They're kind of refusing. So they eventually make their way to the back of the plane. And then here I am standing here. I've snatched the cell phone out of one of them's hand and stripped the backpack off the other one. And I'm sitting here with a backpack in one hand, a cell phone in the other going, this is probably gonna go about one of two ways. So uh, it actually went the good, actually went the good way. And long story short, we wound up getting them off the plane. They wound up coming out to come get them, and I don't know what happened to them after that. So, did you guys have uh, ravens on your plane on that one? We, I mean, that we, was something like after I guess a few days, and they started putting ravens on the planes, right? Uh, yeah, it was after a few days. Uh, no, there were no ravens on the plane. It was a, a basic crew, uh, pilot, co-pilot, and two load masters. That was it. So, uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, something that was probably overlooked at that time. And the way it used to be cut is unless you're on the ground for so long, you didn't have to have Ravens. And so like, I guess when we left there, we weren't supposed to be there that long. And of course, what happened, uh, was not supposed to happen. Yeah. No, you, they anticipate, oh, this is just a uh, flight over to Kabul and back yeah. and it's yeah. going to be normal, normal, but it was good, se- good old seven hour round trip. Man, hearing just how, one, those long flights, then once you start loading all those people up there, getting gas, holding, sitting on the ramp, trying to clear clear the plane and get them over to, to I don't know, what do you want to call them, customs or the holding facility. Like, that just sounds like an absolute nightmare. So, uh, but yeah, that was uh, the, the first night somewhat in the XL while, uh, while we were on the ground. So we wound up uh, leaving. And I'm not going to beat Grace's story to death or hopefully maybe you can talk to Darren one day. But remember when we were leaving, it was a uh, it was a decision to leave. I'll never forget uh, they were doing their uh, their uh, their checklist and they were talking about the uh, at what point they were going to reject. I remember Darren going, I don't think you understand. There is no rejecting on this one. Like none. You know, and I think that's kind of when it set in that like, hey, this has gotten real and we're leaving. I wonder, so, uh, I talked, some 135 guys back in the day, they would, I want to say, you know, there was, you know, certain scenarios, maybe it was like a nuclear launch or, uh, you know, they're going to launch for uh, B-52s and go support that. But, you know, if they could only get three engines going, they would go. I might be making this up completely. I talked to AP about this, right? Like, you think like the last flight out of there, like, would you have taken off three engine? You know, something you would never, ever do uh, normally. But you're like, you know what? It's kind of like a launch for survival type environment. You're like, this is the yeah, one where I'm getting paid for judgment. Yeah, I mean, there's a, if I remember correctly, there's like a three engine climb out. So, I mean, if, and if you've been there before, you know how it is when you leave there. Um, and that was something that's brought up. So, I guess that's where I'm a little bit different than other people. So, I was there the first night this happened. And I was also on the last... Uh, on the last plane leaving out of there also. So second to the last plane the night we left in the, uh, so for the uh, setting the base down or setting the, uh, all of Kabul down. So 
I know that night it was brought up too. It's like three engines, you'll leave. If not, we'll just bring another plane in and y'all get on that one and y'all leave. So, AP was talking about that last the last night, the last uh, briefing. There's some things there where like uh, the word C17 wasn't even mentioned once when he was going to the briefing, and yeah, he kind of he kind of pulled that peeled that onion back a little bit. The piece that really is stuck like stood out to me that I can I don't know empathize or place myself there, but Talk about the five jets that are on the ground. So you're the second to last to take off. But seeing the Taliban jump the fence and just standing there watching you guys take so, off. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you want to fast forward all the way to that yet or not. Oh, we can. Um, the last night was uh, we landed. We landed over on the other side. Of course, there was stuff burning all over the, all over the place. Uh, wound up landing. And it was kind of a uh, eerie, man. It was super eerie. Like we landed, it was super quiet. Um, I remember walking around outside, looking around. Uh, there were some dogs, so I guess the tied into it. I guess uh, there was a contractor over there at one time that turned a lot of uh, bomb dogs loose. I remember hearing on headset like, "Hey, man, we think the army's got dogs. Dogs out here just running around." Next thing you know, I'm at the load, walk back up to the load station. The single purpose German Shepherd with no tail follows me inside and is like in my lap in the load station. I'm like, this dog is not afraid of planes. The engines are running and this dog is inside the plane. And uh, I told myself if we take off that dog, it wasn't going to hurt my feelings. I would explain it later. But uh, cause I like dogs. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was weird, though. So that night I remember uh, we landed. All of a sudden, I see this great big excursion, like, coming straight towards the back of the plane. Of course, we're all on MBGs, and it wound up being a, uh, a surgical team that had been on the ground there for a while. They got on our plane and wound up actually setting up, like, a whole little uh, – It's basically, they take up two pilot positions. They can set up a couple of cots where they can essentially do surgery right there on the plane. They show up, set up their stuff right there on the, on the plane, and then uh, – you're looking out and about, man. You're looking in your MBGs, and you can you can know where the 82nd is because they're all coming in on the airplane. And uh, but you look around, you're like, it is. It's the Taliban, and they're essentially wearing the same stuff that we have. They got MBGs, rifles, plate carriers, and everything else. And it was uh, it was pretty eerie. I mean, knowing that they're just standing like literally right there. <sighs> yeah, that's wild. I apologize. I did, I did jump ahead there. I want to I want to jump back and kind of talk through what what transpired over those two weeks. But you know the whole yeah. thing is just uh, for lack of a better phrase, just kind of weird and eerie. But yeah, let's let's yeah. jump back. So after the first first night, what what kind of transpired? Walk me through the, the those two weeks, what they were like, and uh, so yeah, the first night happened. We got back. Uh, we took off. I'm trying to like uh, think of the thing. Grace already told you a lot of a lot of part of what happened. Um, wound up taking off. I remember being upstairs. I remember wind up, I remember seeing people on the runway. Uh, one of the last things I remember is seeing a flashlight look up at us, and I was like, "Man, I don't know if we cleared that guy or not." Uh, <laughs> so that happened. We wind up landing, and that's where OSI comes in. We wind up sitting there for a while, get everybody's stuff off, and they say, "You know, uh, they're like OSI wants to talk to you." my perspective knowing where i came from again i'm like worst case scenario right i'm like who are they trying what do they want and what are they trying to prove now yep so uh go in and talk to osi and eventually we're like are we under investigation the answer is like uh no we just want to talk to you and get some intel but like me i'm sitting there going come on like you're not, like, you're not doing this just for fun yeah, yeah, it's like you didn't come in. You didn't come in just just come do that. But it all worked out. Um, they gave us uh, told us they let us know we could fly again. Lo and behold, uh, Darren, Texas, a couple of hours later, and I think we got set. They gave us twenty four hours off. Wound up getting set, and then uh, off we went again for round two. So, uh, were you? What, did you guys have people who were stowaways in the gear? Uh, no. Not to my knowledge. Okay. I think that was going to be the planes that were actually like behind us. Okay. So, uh, yeah, everything you saw the morning of like the people, the stowaways, that was actually like, we left, we left while it was still dark and they left and the, they left as soon as the sun came up. So we okay. left the gates are being breached and man, you could see them shooting all over the place. I remember the JTAC coming across the radio telling us, Hey man, you got bees and you got Marines that were prone underneath the airplane at the time. 
Uh, I remember there was an MRAP out to the side. I've heard 50 cows shot before, and I remember looking at Grace and going, hey, you know what that noise is? She goes, I think it's gunshots. And then we wind up telling Darren, and Darren, I guess, it, could see it from upstairs. He's like, yeah, yeah, they're beside us shooting. So kind of where it went. Man. Yeah, that's sporty. Well, again, I can't even can't even imagine. I don't think anyone thought it going that way, that's for sure. So you guys, yeah, so you didn't have anyone there, so you guys weren't under investigation. I did hear uh, AP, you know, he said those guys, they spent a year under investigation. Um, and I might, I don't want to be like misinformation, but I can completely see that being uh, the case when they're going through, which I can't even imagine what that crew went through, let alone like the maintainers yeah. on the ground having to deal with that. Like that is not a, that is not a pretty, pretty thing to have to deal with. No, not at all. What's, uh, I assume like the next couple of weeks leading up to the final mission, not to say they were routine, but I assume there's more of a rhythm that you guys got into. We Trinity's. did. Uh, yeah. So, uh, round two wasn't as bad. There was some, uh, something that happened, uh, or some things that like went on, uh, round two, you would go, we actually sit, man. So, uh, we take enough fuel. Usually I think, uh, we'd sit for like, two, three hours doing an Eero, wait for them to bring people out or whatever they wanted to bring out. Uh, normally it was people. So uh, I think it was round two I was there. I normally don't check my phone. I'm the type of person, like if I'm on the ground, I leave my phone. Uh, but after the first night, I learned to uh, take my phone. Because the second I got my phone, I had multiple texts from uh, the squadron saying, y'all leave and leave now. So, uh, yeah, like leave. So uh, after the first night, I was like, I'll check my phone like every time I update the AC upstairs about what's going on. So I looked at my phone and I had a message and uh, there's a guy that lives or he lives uh, south of us and every, he was in the army and wound up having some interpreters that were over there at one time. And uh, he knew I was over there and sent me a message. He's like, hey, man, my interpreters are trying to uh, are trying to get to the gate. Can you help them out? And I was like, dude, I want no part of this. I was like, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. I was like, but if I can, I'll let you know. So we wound up taking everybody on the plane and there was a, a female that got on the plane and she got on the plane and she spoke really, really good English. I was like, are you know, are you here visiting? She's like, no, I'm a dual citizen. I was here seeing my family while this was all going on. She lived in San Francisco. So I went, hey, I got a buddy that has some interpreters that are trying to get out of there because I think one of them was like a police chief or like whatever is equivalent to a police chief in one of the towns. And he knew what was going to happen. And so I said, hey, uh, if I give you these guys numbers, can you help them try to get in some way, somehow to get into the gate? So long story short, she wound up calling them on the phone. We got landed in Al UD. She was on the phone with them again. And lo and behold, she wound up telling them how to actually get in and make it to uh, get out of that place. Wow. So, yeah, like uh, I thought that was uh, pretty cool. I don't know what happened to them since then. I think they came to the U.S. They made it over to the U.S. somewhere. And I just never really followed up on it. But I thought that was a, uh, just to show you how small of a world it is. And like, just pass a phone number off to somebody and they say, you know, they made it. It's, it's why, I mean, you put that group of people there. People want to solve problems. Usually when you're in the military, I had my buddy, Carl Miller, I re-released his episode in August, but he was transitioning from Texas to DC going to school. When all this went down, he was a former C-17 guy way back in the day, but did two Oh sixes in afghanistan so he knew a lot of afghans but like quickly like the network on whatsapp and facebook like that kind of spun up and they're trying to help guys get out and i've told the story many times on the podcast but I, to me it's very profound he had this afghan colonel is up in Majur sharif had made his way down to kabul trying to get his family out so he's making this trek like three or four days down to kabul you know burned everything he had and threw you know every every shred of evidence that might tie him to the u.s but makes it to the gate and he's on the cell. Uh, he's on a call with Carl back in the States and, you know, somehow convinces this young Marine at the, the gate to take the phone and Carl talks to him. He's like, Hey, you don't know me, but this is who I am. If you can help this guy, uh, I'd be greatly appreciative. You know, he's a friend of the United States. So the guy got him through, but I was like, just the fact that, you know, he's a world away this Marine. Cause you know, again, this piece, like if someone walked up to you on the street and handed you a phone, saying, hey, take this, like, well, like, first thing you do, like, get away from me. I'm not taking the yeah. phone. Like, you're going to have to do some convincing, let alone if you're on the gate, uh, on the fence there in Afghanistan with a mob of crowd. Like, you're not getting anywhere near that. So 
it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so two wasn't too bad. Uh, I remember we would come back and land. I guess the worst part was, is for me, is like you would come back and land. Of course, it's the deed in the middle of summer. Uh, there were times like it's, uh, I remember we first landed, they would tell you, you got to keep the plane closed up. Well, the APUs couldn't keep up. And that's how that plane was hitting. Like as soon as I would look up and thermostat would be like at a hundred. Uh, I was like, man, like we got to do something. People are passing out. They're getting sick. Uh, I'm sitting there watching, uh, man, I watched several infants have what they call febrile seizures because they were so hot. Not only that, not, not only were they hot, they were also sick. You got to remember they've been standing in feces. They haven't eaten, hadn't drank anything. Uh, they were all around each other. Viruses were going around like uh, these kids were just, I mean, sick as can be. And I'm sitting there watching kids have febrile seizures. So we don't have any working refrigerators on the plane at the time. So the only thing I had was a uh, bottle of water that I kept upstairs. It was cool enough. You know, the, the, I mean, that's all you could do. Uh, as far as emergency services on the base, they were overwhelmed. You know, the fire department, the EMTs, I think at one time they had PJs that were out there. I think they were actually recruit uh, the PJs that actually recruited a uh, girl from the guard uh, who was a paramedic on the outside, and she was attached to them. So she was going around doing what she was doing, but uh, sitting on the ground for hours. I'm talking hours, uh, anywhere from like six to twelve hours. You would just sit there, and so that one day I finally called a you know a emergency on the ground. I was like, we got to open the doors. We got to open the door and ramp. Uh, they were starting to fight in the airplane. They were starting to panic. And one of the things I did, I tried to put myself in their shoes. I was like, you just put me in this big aluminum container. I can't see outside the window. You just took me from a place that I called home. I have no idea where I'm going. You got some guy that I understand nothing he's saying on the PA up front. I like, you won't open the doors and ramp. We're literally cooking inside this airplane. I mean, the panic was setting in, but... As soon as I opened the door and ran, believe it or not, like the panic went away. Just that little bit of breeze and open air, and they didn't go very far. And so that kind of, I think, after that became the standard, you know. Uh, you know, it was uh, that, and it was quite disgusting on the air on the airplane, too. Uh, some people giving these people food and water who hadn't ate or drank in quite some time. They were already sick. There's smells in those planes that will, will never go away. I uh, saw one, I think it was – Grace sent me the photo of one of the bathrooms. I did not share that on social media, but I mean, it was just like, oh, that was I, all of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't even. I, I, I mean, it's like a Talladega race weekend porta potty that got shooken up like a snow globe. I mean, it was terrible. Yeah, or uh, so the sidewall seats. You would unfold the sidewall seats and found where that's where they had went. And they would fold the seat back up. Oh uh, God. Yeah, like on the floor, it didn't matter. Like it was everywhere. So best thing you do, just open it, open, open the door and ramp, and just uh, let it go. But you know, let them out, let them go see the, let them go see the light. And they started feeding them MREs, so then they get still get sick. So it was, uh, it was that way every time you landed, every time. Man, that's crazy. How many trips did you make between the the breach? of uh, the airport and the final flight uh i want to say four somewhere in there those two weeks kind of like completely ran together i'll be honest uh my roommate banks was a scheduler and uh i think i got the whatever was going around there at one time and i'll be honest that was probably the sickest i've ever been in my entire life there was about three days there in the middle of that i don't remember that uh so i didn't fly Oh, it was, it was awful. And everybody was getting sick. Like all the pilots, load masters. I mean, we were all, there's no telling what we were exposed to. Like literally no telling. Uh, we were all sick. So uh, those two weeks kind of, uh, kind of were a blur. And then, uh, next thing you know, I got picked up for the, uh, the last one out of there. So. Man. What, tell me some of your thoughts that last flight out, what, what was going through your mind? Uh, I wasn't worried about getting stuck there. We had they had a pretty good contingency plan. Uh, one of the things I think they failed to look over were the uh, the two jets that were going to be the rescue jets for us. Uh, they uh, they had some pretty solid people on those, so I wasn't worried about that. I guess more I worried about than anything was that uh, they had put so much faith, I guess, into this trusting the. Uh, the Taliban at that point in time, you know, all they had to do was just flip a switch and like, we would have been stuck there, you know, 
they could have uh, they could have destroyed the runway while we were sitting there. They could have done anything. You know, all I was remembering was what was going on before then. I know there were times that uh, we landed there, and uh, matter of fact, uh, Liam McVale was there on the. I think he was the one on the ground. They literally taxied an airplane out in the middle of the runway, parked it, got out, and left. So that's the kind. Yeah, that's the kind of shady stuff that was going on. So that's the only thing you could think of the whole time is what kind of shade, what shady, and what's fixing to go on now. So um, it kind of went flawless. Uh, I know when the last two little birds flew by, and they did their little circles around everything to check on everything. That uh, that was pretty much going to be about it. They landed those two little birds, and it was shortly after that we were leaving there. You you bring up a good point. The fact, I think when you said flawless is probably the best way to, to put that. Because, again, it worked out. Everyone left. That could have gone sideways so fast. And you see the the political, if, if the Taliban had done something, who knows? Um, one, we might have just had a couple drone strikes to retaliate, but they would have chalked up how many U.S. service members killed. You know, for them would have been a huge huge victory in their eyes. So the fact that they didn't do anything when we were so vulnerable is rather amazing. Again, telling your enemy the plan before you do it, generally ill advisable, but uh, yeah, that's what we did. So there you go. It worked. Yeah. I try to stay out of the political standpoint of it all. We talk about that offline, but yeah, it was, uh, I'm glad it worked out. Um, so the uh, other trips were pretty, uh, like I said, so we got the first one. Second one was that one. The rest of the trips, you would go in and literally land. Sometimes they bring you a pilot. Sometimes they bring you people. Sometimes you'd be like, hey, man, we got like 45 minutes. We can Eero sitting here. So you would sit and wait and they would bring you something, uh, just something random just to say you took something back. Both time it was people, though. So you get a pretty good amount of people coming out of there. So, yeah. Uh, and then I guess like the last night, and then that kind of summed up the the flying aspect of it all. I guess what was more, more impressive to me was like how you took a bunch of people and put them all in a squadron together, all from different bases, different walks of life. And uh, even my time at the police and fire department, I'd never seen people come together like that before. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty overwhelming to see how well the, the eight sixteenth actually came together despite all odds and everything that was going on. We talked about it a little bit before we hit record. We should pull that thread a little bit, the the blend between guard, reserve, active duty, and what that's good. I think you do make a really good point. And I've, I've said it. You never, I think, will see another organization where you throw a bunch of people from various backgrounds, likes, dislikes, et cetera, but you throw an objective out there. Everyone wants to win. Usually, you know, like everyone wants to, to pull their weight and make it happen. Uh, that's what, I mean, I liked about, you know, being in a fighter squadron, right? Like everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to be the best. There's a healthy competition that's going on. But like when the, when the flag goes up, everyone's is rowing the same direction, trying to make it happen. What, how did it work out? So you're a guardsman, but you're ending up, you know, on a crew most of the time with active duty. Right. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the Guard Reserve for people who aren't quite aware and then how you blend it in or how, how the Guard Reserve blend into the active duty. All right. So uh, that one, that situation is a little unique. I've actually helped pull it off since then. But uh, so it went over uh, on Title 10 mission was active duty orders. Active duty essentially says, hey, we're going to pay for a tail and, you know, a crew or however many crews. Uh, you're signed to active duty pretty much at that point, though you're still in the Guard or Reserves. Um, and you start flying active duty missions. Like I said, I got, I was able to stay. So they kept me on orders there and essentially like, so my crew left and went home. Uh, I wound up staying, wound up being, uh, you know, essentially part of the eight sixteenth, which was that time was primarily made up of, uh, primarily Charleston, uh, some out of McCord. There's a little bit from Travis McGuire and Dover, but the majority of it was Charleston. Um, and I mean, we were all a blended crew. Um, we did some hard crew stuff, but, uh, most of it was all blended. Uh, you fly with the same crew twice and they would kind of, you know, the AC or your primary load master would fly with somebody else different then. So that's kind of how that all worked out. But like it was people from all walks of life, all walks of life, um, all different experience levels. 
and uh, I guess kind of to watch it come together. I guess the awkward part was is when the crew showed up to come relieve them. You could tell like there was a big uh, disconnect, I guess, because we had all be- become so close. And uh, the new crew coming in, it's kind of, I guess, I'm sure you probably saw it in a fighter squadron somewhere too. Uh, like, who's, who's this guy? Yeah. Well, one of the funny things was, is like, uh, I mean, what do you do on deployment? You grow a mustache, right? Yeah. There were some pretty gnarly mustaches when uh, when we left that place. And I remember the new crew came in and the uh, DO was like, uh, hey, that mustache ain't going to cut it. It's out of regs and you didn't quite earn it. So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, it was uh it was good times so, though. Um but guard reserve, that's how it works. And so like now if the uh active duty wants uh or has room for supplements for guard or reserve, uh we'll work it out. So like uh we got several guys over there right now again with Charleston uh for the fifteenth. Um we'll have several go out with uh uh they'll go out with uh Travis here later on. So we'll kind of supplement the active duty units. So that's you just leave the guard and go to active duty for a little while, and then come back. Yeah, get reblued, and then realize like, oh, why did I, why did I ever do that? It's not always bad, though. Of course, I will tell you, uh, <laughs> aviation or uh, aviation is a whole nother uh, whole nother. It, it should be something completely separate. We don't kind of operate like anybody else does. So yeah, fair enough. Well, Brett, I hope uh, if you're willing to hang around here for a There I Was story, we'll do that. But before we wrap up, any any other parting shots or thoughts you have uh, that you'd like to share on the whole deal? I mean, I know a lot of time, energy invested, um, so I don't want to shortchange you. No. Uh, man, like I said, uh, the biggest thing was, is for me, is it worked. It worked out um, and how people came together. Cause you asked me earlier in the podcast about like, you know, uh, how I felt about things or maybe like how police and fire department shaped me as a person. And I told you, you know, it, I didn't like who the person that it made me, I will say, despite all odds and what all happened, uh, after seeing everybody come together, like they did over there and everything work out, it kind of like put a new, uh, new outlook on things. Uh, I guess the hardest part for me also was coming back, man. I probably have the most supportive squad in the entire world. Uh, everybody was super supportive. Uh, like I couldn't imagine being a commander or a DO of a guard unit going, yeah, I'm going to send, I'm going to leave my guy over there. You know what I mean? Uh, or even the chief, but they were, they, man, they supported every, supported every step of the way. I guess the hard part for me was, is coming back. A lot of things that I still won't talk about, a lot of things I still, uh, don't want to talk about, uh, was the fact that when I came back, I wasn't the same person I was when I left. And it's hard or you it's hard to convey that to somebody. It's like, hey, I know when I left here, I was fairly new in here, new loadmaster, but they don't understand. And it's not you can't make them understand some of the things you saw, some of the things that you did that it shaped you and you're a different person when you come back. Um, I guess that's the hardest part for me. Uh, and then I think we t- talked about it uh, a little bit. So I've had a lot of people that were involved in that, like reach out. I've always been a big listener. Mental health has been something that's been in every uh, every aspect of every job that I've had. To be honest, uh, in the civilian side, law enforcement and fire department completely failed miserably in mental health. Uh, like it just if you say that you have a problem, you essentially better go find a new job. Is what they're going to tell you. Um, as aviators, I'll tell you about uh, what happens when you go and talk to somebody. What's the first thing they do to you when you go ask for help? No, you're the NIF. You're not flying anymore. So yeah. So this is my, uh, this is my thing. I'm still looking for an answer. Uh, I brought it up to some people. I was like, there's a lot of, a lot of load masters, a lot of pilots that, uh, they won't help. They can't ask for help. They ask for help. You de-niff them. If you de-niff somebody from something they love doing, you just compounded the problem. You made it worse. So somehow, some way that's going to be my end goal is to have, uh, there's quite a few people still out there that, you know, won't help, but they can't get it. So that's that is a, that's something that we're talking about. I mentioned it with the live stream with AP and Voodoo because there was a thing that came out um, to get a class one medical to fly for the airlines. You got to do that every six months if you're over 40, every year if you're under the age of 40. If you have any kind of VA disability uh, benefits or ratings, you got to tell your, your uh, aeromedical doctor what those are. 
I think there are some guys who are abusing the system, but it is to that point. Like this, the physical you get for your class one. I mean, assuming you're mostly healthy, like is a joke. You're not doing a blood draw to see how your cholesterol is doing. If you're over 40, you get an EKG, but it's really like, hey, how are you doing? Check the box. Like, yeah, I think he's good. But if you had like any, if you had post-traumatic stress, if you had any kind of mental health, like depression, you know, et cetera, that you were dealing with, like that medical, it's, you're not getting it right away. You're going to be going to see specialists and all sorts of stuff. Now, if you're factor like, well, all right, how do you provide for your family, pay your bills? You know, the, the thing that you loved doing just amplifies and increases the stress on it. So I don't know what the answer is. I think uh, that's a very commendable path to, to go down because like you said, there are a lot of people out there who are struggling and everyone goes through these, everyone goes through ups and downs and things, but you're right. As a, as an aviator, uh, you don't get much leeway when it comes to mental health. Some, you know, some of it right, some of it wrong, but it's like, if you need to take a knee, it shouldn't be a, Hey, this is a career ender for you. And that's the fear. And I think honestly dealing with a medical side of it, especially FAA side of it, it's like, that's it. You're done. Um, so hopefully more advocates for it. Yeah. I mean, that's, let's, let's be real. Uh, I mean, you're a pilot, you see more than me, uh, one thing that pilots and uh, avia- people in aviation like to do is drink, but like uh, like you said, or they let things go on for a long time. They should be going to should be addressing, you know, as far as like a, some kind of illness of some kind. They know if they go, they're denif, so they let things go for too long, and then it becomes a severe problem. So uh, I don't know how to solve it. I've asked uh, I've asked people, uh, still haven't got any answers. And I guess that's kind of going to be my thing. I want to find some answers for some people. Uh, yeah, I I think man, more people talking about it is the is the obviously how it starts. I will say the FA the way that airlines do it now with AQP the qualification standards it's much different. Like when I was in the Air Force, right? I think it probably still does. Like you could trace an, you know one molecule of fuel from the fuel truck all the way through the plane and where it came out the exhaust pipe. Do you need to know how to do that? No, right? Yeah. Like it was almost, it's an exercise just to prove how much more the instructor or the examiner knows than the new guy. And it's a waste. Like there, there are things you need to know. And there's some things that no matter what you do, there's nothing you can do to change it. Like what's the PSI of the high pressure fuel pump? I mean, I asked that question when I was giving check rides. I didn't know any better. Like, doesn't matter if it doesn't work guess what your engine doesn't work like you don't care what the psi is of it so it's a silly little game and i always say this because fa they've adopted this aqp and i think it's a it's a good thing it's like focus on stuff that actually really matters and the silly stuff let's not do it but that needs to migrate its way to the medical side of things and having more of a i guess as an open mind the right way to phrase it but realizing that Again, some people sometimes you need to take a knee or breather or get a little help here for X period of time, but that's not like hey, unrecoverable and you can't come back from it, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, just because you want to go sit on the bench for a minute doesn't mean they should kick you off the team, <laughs> is kind of the way I look at it, you know. Yeah, right. They, I mean, you, you, they all take their all star player out every now and then and give them a break. Yeah, that's a great analogy and way to put it, but I think. I think it starts with just people having a conversation about it because we all know people and, you know, it's like, dude, I never wanted to go to NIF. And that's duty's not involving flying for those who aren't familiar, but basically you get a cold, you go to the flight doc, you go, you're to NIF until your cold is over or the medication, it's half life or whatever is done running its course through your body. Well, yeah, I'm just going to like suffer through it. You know, it's like, I'm just going to, just make it happen. If you go look at my medical records, I didn't get anything documented because I never. I was like, I'm never going sick, but better believe I was sick and hurt things over the the course oh, of my yeah. active duty career. You know, it's like this is dumb. Why didn't I get this documented? I'll pay for it for the rest of my life now. But what can you do? Uh, we'll get it figured out somehow. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that. Anything else you want to hit on? I think that was a really good point. That again, the stuff that you just in that two week time span. The things you were exposed to, your crew was exposed to, you saw, I mean, you yeah, saw uh, humanity at, at, at a really low point. And imagine uh, high stress, long days, not a good thing. That's going to change you no matter what. 
Yeah, uh, sleep was pretty much non-existent. I'll be honest. Uh, that was one of the things. Of course, I don't sleep much anyway, but there wasn't much sleeping going on then. You never knew when you're going to get set, when you weren't going to get set. Sometimes uh, they may or may not have set you with no crew rest, and at that point in time, you just kind of like roll on with the punches. Uh, <laughs> grab I some guess rippets. Uh, yeah, some rippets. Uh, Man, the care packages, they were sending care packages there, there for a while. Uh, like uh, on Sundays, uh, it'd be something on had to do with Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A sauce on Sundays. You go to the DFAT, get some chicken, pretend it's Chick-fil-A. You know, whatever. <laughs> like there was so much stuff going in and out at that point in time. Uh, I guess how everything just came together. That was the, that was the big thing. Yeah, people make it happen. I said it before, I'll say it again. It's impressive to watch. It's how it should have gone down in the sense of aviators executing, using judgment, making it happen. And that's what getting paid to do. And I think hearing all the stories, man, it was it was flawless when it comes down to it. Like those were some yeah. tough times and challenging situations and people were they were being champions, stepping up to the plate, making it happen. So Kudos to the, the C-17 community, maintainers, I mean, everyone who was involved in that. That was not an easy thing to be involved in. So thanks. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for sharing your story. I hope Will you hang around for a There I Was story here? Yeah, sure will. All right, awesome.